Welcome to Swarm of Comics. I'm Randy, your handsome and humble host. Today's episode is my top 10 comics not drawn by Rob Liefeld. And what does that mean? Um, I don't know. It seemed like clickbait to get you to click on it and watch an episode about some cool comics that I've uh, read over the years and different series that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't, maybe you've picked up or not, but I wanted to just pick a really cool, different list of stuff that I've read. Sure, I like Spider-Man and I like Captain America and I like a lot of those regular books. There's some other interesting things out there that I've read over the years. So this is just sort of a, a 10 books that might be cool to pick up if you've never read them before. So we're going to start with the first book. Um, it's called Sea of Sorrow, and it is not based on an Alice in Chains song. It is an IDW book, and it is by Rich Doeck and Alex Cormack. I am not responsible for the pronunciations of anybody's names. I can, you know, I can barely read. So this book I picked up at a con when I got to meet Alex Cormack, and it is a really cool horror book um, about a naval officer that wants to go back to a sunken U-boat that's full of gold. So he hires a ship and they got to go there. And of course it's got cool diving helmets and things like that. Um, and the horrors of the deep. So I really enjoyed this. I think this was just four issues and um, I thought it had a really good horror vibe, at a, you know, an old school post-war Sora sort of feel to it. A little dark and spooky. So really like that book. Also uh, drawn by Alex Cormack, as I mentioned, I met him and he's very nice and not drawn by Rob Liefeld. All right, up next, try not to, to babble too much here. This next book is an image book. Um, this is the last issue. It happened to have been the one that I grabbed first and it's called 8 Billion Genies. And I think it had a bit of a buzz when it first uh, had come out um, a year ago, two years ago, whatever it was. Um, but it is by Charles Soule and Ryan Brown from Image Comics. You see that pretty good. It's a little genie right there. Um, basically, everybody on Earth is granted one wish. They get a little genie that pops up and you get one wish. What could go wrong? Um, it started like a pretty grounded series about some people stuck in a bar that all get these genies and they come from all different walks of life and how they ended up there and how they deal with their wish. Do they save it? Do they blow it right away? Do they do something stupid? What does everybody wish for? When you think about it, if you had one wish, what would you wish for? Of course, you start thinking about the monkey's paw. Read that if you don't know it. Um, by the end of this series, it was absolutely bonkers, um, which is probably what would really happen. And they really sort of gave you almost an origin of it by the end, by this eighth issue. Can't see it's pretty whited out, but eight billion genies. Eight of eight. And uh, pretty good series, worth picking up, get the trade or whatever, fun series to read. Eight Billion Genies. How do you not love a book called Eight Billion Genies? It's pretty funny too. This next book, uh, I actually have the trade. Um, I don't think I ever had the original issues. I picked it up much later on, uh, a couple of years after it had come out, but I, I probably had it since the trade came out. I think the trade came out in 1991, and I think the series came out in 1989. So this one is called Hawk World from DC Comics by Timothy Truman. He wrote and drew the issue. It's got a, got a really kind of cool artwork feel to it, a little bit different. Um, as I've talked about before, or if you've not watched my videos, you're hearing it now, I'm not much of a DC Comics person. I love the golden age stuff like uh, Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman, all, all the big heroes and things like that. There's some great um, books, um, but I never really read them. I never read those series. I was a Marvel guy. Um, what attracted me to this book, and it might attract you, is that it was sort of a reimagining post-crisis um, of his origin. So this origin goes all the way back to his home planet of uh, Thanagar. Um, the character's name is uh, Qatar Hall or Carter Hall. And um, this series uh, wipes away his original Silver Page, uh, Silver Age origin and rewrites it. And it starts with him as a young recruit that's actually from a very wealthy family and is a, a big uh, cast system there on his home world. And he comes to um, find out that there's a lot of corruption and there's a lot of uh, you know conquering of the world's other world, slavery, et cetera. So um, sort of Carter fights against that, uh, has to go into hiding for a long time and comes back. And I won't spoil it, but 
It uh, eventually was so popular that it got its own series. Um, but uh, this is a great one here. So it has a lot of themes uh, about social inequality and class. And I think the artwork is really different. And I think it still holds up today, especially because it's a, a sci-fi book. It's not really dated, but uh, great, great artwork in there. Just cool visuals. I'd show them to you, but my camera stinks. But you know, you kind of, it's a comic book. It's got pictures. In it. So pick up Hawk World if you can. It's a great book. All right, moving on. This book I absolutely love. I read it when it came out in 2007, 2006, and um, dug it out recently to reread it again. Um, this book, I feel like was criminally underrated, under the radar. It was from Boom Studios back in 2006. And I'm not even sure people knew who Boom Studios were back then. I think they've gotten a much bigger profile since. But in 2006, I had not really heard of them. And when I reread read this book from 2006 into seven, um, there's a lot of ads for other books in there, and I still don't recognize any of the others, and I'm not sure any of them ever lasted. But this book was excellent. So I, I actually have all the issues. I don't know why. I'm going to just show you the first one. But it's called Exile. It has a little bit of an X-Files look to the cover. Um, you can see all the issues here. Oh, spoilers. There's monsters. Um, oh, maybe aliens, but I'm not confirming that. And, but real creepy stuff. I mean, that would look good on the cover of uh, any horror book today or, you know, um, uh, something's eating the children or whatever. But this book uh, was done by Andrew Crosby and Michael Allen Nelson. And it's about a scientific expedition. Some creature washes up on shore at a beach and nobody recognizes the DNA or the creature or anything like that. So they start to go out and try and hunt down where it came from. And the, there's a shipwreck and they end up on a mysterious island and the crew and the scientists all battle unfamiliar creatures and unfamiliar plant life. Um, and it's very much uh, in the spirit of Jurassic Park, the alien movies and Lost. And that is all in my wheelhouse. So if you can pick this up in a trade or even the original issues, probably not super expensive. It is called Exile and it's five issues. And I absolutely love that book. I enjoyed rereading it again. It held up. And that's one of my problems with older books and is a lot of them just don't hold up. They're either too wordy or just too goofy or whatever it happens to be. It's one of my problems I have when I pick up um, Bronze Age books, Silver Age books. People talk about that if you slab old books or key books, it's sealed up. You're never going to be able to read it. I don't know. Have you read some of these? They're not very good. They're pretty terrible, actually. They were probably great in 1964 if I was, you know, six years old, but they're not great to reread now for entertainment. And that's just me. So the next book I want to talk about, hopefully people have heard of this, but it felt like it uh, ran under the radar again, it had a little boom when it came out. But this one was by Alan Moore and Chris Sprouse. This is from 1999, I think, the first appearance, and it was from Alan Moore's own brand called uh, America's Best Comics. And I think America's Best Comics ended up falling under, um, I don't know whether it was part of DC or as part of Image. I think it was part of Image and ended up as part of DC, but this one is called Tom Strong. And I absolutely love this painted color cover from Alex Ross. This is the first issue. I have all of the issues. And this is um about a science hero and his family um and they battle crazy villains and it's very steampunk futuristic but also throwback to the 1920s um sort of in a different alternate earth that grew up different they're still flying zeppelins around but they also have computers but they have talking gorillas and it's a big tribute and spoof to old pulp magazines like doc savage and old pulp heroes like that i mean i, I don't even think it's i don't even think it's subtle that it's supposed to be doc savage inspired i have a vague recollection he might have even met doc savage in an issue but um so this is tom strong himself and this is the shirt he has this is his symbol it's just a big silver triangle on his chest and the reason i tell this funny story is back in you know the late 90s 1999 2000 i bought the shirt it's a red shirt with a big uh, triangle on it like that tom strong but it, most people don't know what it is, and I would wear it in my band at the time. We were called Moto Cops 2000. You can find us on Bandcamp and Facebook and uh, also streaming on Spotify and other places. But we were called Moto Cops 2000 based on characters in a Stephen King book, but here and there. 
I used to wear this shirt and everybody would say Nanu Nanu to me because they thought I was trying to be Mork for Mork, which of course is not what I was being, but um, it's Tom Strong. So please don't say Nanu Nanu to me. Do not comment Nanu Nanu. I'm very sensitive about it. Uh, I did love Robin Williams and I did love Mork for Mork when I was a kid, but it's Tom Strong. So fantastic book. Pick those up in trades. Excellent throwback pulp sci-fi steampunk feel to that. The next one, I'm going to try and keep this part short, but some of you might know this. This is a book called Exo Man of War. Exo Man of War. This is just some of the really cool covers of this volume here. Who doesn't love skulls? Skull covers are the best. We'll step back here. Oh, see, that's better. You got to tell me not to be so close to the camera. Plus, you can see my Charlton group shirt. Sure. So XL Man of War started out as a Valiant book back in 1992, um, ran for a while, and then ended up Valiant became Valiant Entertainment. And in 2013, could have been 2012, they revamped the whole series and started it over again. Um, it was sort of reimagined. I think it even won an award. Carrie Nord drew it. I don't remember the artist. I didn't take note of that. But the, it was reimagined as a series about um, a tribe of Visigoths, you know, always at war with the Roman Empire back in the fifth century. And one of them, and the, actually the whole tribe, gets kidnapped by um, alien race. They take them as slaves for their ships, and they're sort of a plant-based aliens. And Exo Man of War is on the ship with his people, and he ends up becoming um exo man of war because he merges with the shanhara which is the name of this um exo man of war class sentient armor it shoots lasers and flies and it talks to him and tells him what to do and it's the fish out of water thing some barbarian visigoth is suddenly in the space age and so forth and of course they throw in a little bit of the angle from um uh, the original Planet of the Apes, where they're on these spaceships. And when they eventually get back to Earth, because they've been traveling so far through space, the Earth is advanced to modern times, but they're still alive. Um, but this volume here is volume, um, I think this is volume, th there's volume three, and then volume four. This happens to be volume four. I would not recommend volume five. It mostly stinks. Um, but it's these great heavy cardstock issues. You'll know them because they're, they're yellow and they're cool covers, but find volume three. I think from like 2013 to like 2020, this ran the two, two volumes, but this is an absolute great book. I really did love it. And bonus, as I mentioned earlier, not drawn by Rob Liefeld. Um, not that there's any feet in this picture. They don't draw feet either. Look at that. Maybe they're inspired by Rob Liefeld. No feet. No, we haven't seen any feet so far. Oh, you're going to laugh. There's no feet on this one either. This one people will probably know, or at least they know the story. This one is from DC Comics. Again, not a big DC guy, but they make some good stuff here and there. And this is year one, Green Arrow, year one. Um, this is 2007, and they revamped the origin of uh, the character Green Arrow. Um, people probably know this series be, you know, they know the theme of the series or the background of the series because it ended up becoming an inspiration in the flashback sequences for the live action TV show Arrow that was on the CW in like 2012. So when there would be flashbacks to how we became Arrow, it was inspired by this. And this is a fantastic book. There's four issues, I think. Um, I didn't dig them all up, but artwork is excellent. And, you know, it's it's great to learn how Green Arrow ended up, uh, you know, uh, Oliver Queen ended up, you know, rich, spoiled kid, ended up uh, in the middle of a mess that uh, brought him back down to earth and made him want to be a hero. So pick this book up, Green Arrow, year one. I think it's under the radar. I don't think the series is worth a lot. I have to look it up. If it is, I'm going to have to get this pressed by my buddy, Tom Anderson, who does comic pressing. Ooh. I should have put these in bags and boards. Honestly, guys. All right, moving right along. Let's get through this. It's not too long. Next book, uh, another one I thought was really going to take off. All these independent books started coming out like 8 Billion Genies and Saga had been out and a lot of these books um, and some great writers on them. And I just thought this one was going to take off more. Um, I absolutely loved it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. And also, uh, not drawn by La Rob Liefeld. This one's by uh, Chip Zdarsky, who I know from writing Daredevil. Had a great run on Daredevil. Um, and also Ramon K. Perez. And this book is called Stillwater. Cool covers, 
This is issue one, second printing. Um, I guess it was popular enough at the beginning to get a second printing. I didn't really care. But um, this is by Image, Skybound Publications, but an image book. There's a lot of image books here and Boom Studio books. I didn't realize I read that many image books, but this is Stillwater. So if you haven't heard of it, the name is terrible. Stillwater does not get anybody to buy a book, but Stillwater is actually the name of a town. It's in a backwater, remote town, less than a thousand people. And what the secret is, no one can die if you live there and no one ages. Time basically stopped in this town. And they do a great job of trying to keep people out and keep people in. So would living like this be a paradise or a complete nightmare? Spoiler, if it was a paradise, there wouldn't be a comic book about it. But it follows a character named Daniel who left the town when he was very young and then comes back. I think I have to reread it, but to find his mother or he was adopted and he wants to find his real mother. Um, and he goes back and another spoiler. That was time for you to mute it. Um, when he get, finds his mother, she's the same age as he is because she hasn't aged. But anyway, great book. What happens? Crazy ending. Excellent series. Pick that up. I think there's 18 issues, um, but really, really good. Um, all right. Next one is this just happens to be one of the um, one of the random issues from it. Um, I, I don't know where my all my original books are or anything like that. But this is another image comic. Um, this series started back in, I think, 2013. It's still going today. Um, it's had a lot of um, uh, issues with being late. And they've tried different things to keep it on time. Um, but if you have never heard of it and you decide to read it now, it'll be great because you're going to get a whole backlog you didn't have to wait for. Um, and this book is called Lazarus. This one happens to be Lazarus Risen. But it started as a monthly series. And I think it then became a quarterly series, but they still couldn't stay on time. So they took a break. And now they're back to being a monthly series, I think. And this is by Greg Rucka and um, Michael Lark. Um, art, art is absolutely fantastic. Um, this cover doesn't tell you much, but it's pretty spooky evil there. But Lazarus, that's a little bit of a giveaway. But it's about a, it's a dystopian sci-fi book in the future. And all of the countries have gone to war. And what hashed out is that all of these families or cartels, and they're basically giant corporations, have split up all the countries in the earth um, and run things. And everybody's sort of, they wouldn't call them a slave, but there's the regular people and then there's the handful of rich people. And all of these families are defended. Everybody agreed in the truce when they split up the world after the war and the corporations in these nine families won or whatever, they agreed that everybody would have one champion of them, their family. And that was the Lazarus. Um, so the that's the book is based on. It's a super soldier. Everybody gets a super soldier. And the main family, Carlisle, has a super soldier named Forever. And it's basically a cloning thing. She kind of finds out that she's a clone. She's not a real family member and she's sort of programmed and, you know, she wants to, she's trapped in this role defending her family. And is it right? Is her family even right? And there's a lot of political intrigue and there's wars between the families and secret missions. This would absolutely be an amazing TV series. I, I don't know why this is not. I hope this has been optioned, but it's 10 years old at this point and I haven't seen anything, but pick up Lazarus. Absolutely fantastic book. I think there's a side series to call X66, but wonderful post-apocalyptic sci-fi book, if you haven't read it. And like I said, done by uh, Michael Lark. No feet on here as well, but not Rob Liefeld, as you can tell from the art. Very photorealistic. Well done. Great stuff. All right. Last book here. This one is called We Only Find Them When They're Dead. And that sounds more like it should be some type of like late 2000s metalcore band or something like that, um, but it's not. And this is also by Boom Studios. And it's called, again, We Only Find Them When They're Dead. And it's by Al Ewing and um, Simone DeMaio. DeMaio? You can read it. It just says it right there. Look it up on the internet. I'm not, I'm not your teacher. So Boom Studios, uh, I think the series ran... Started in 2020, and it probably ran 12 or 13 issues or something like that. I have them all. Heavy cardstock, nice book. And the style, is, that's a cool cover. I, they really want you to know the title of that one. Um, but it's called We Only Find Them When They're Dead. And you're going to say to yourself, well, that's odd. Why is it called that? Well, the series has a very anime feel. You can see that from the cover. 
I mean, I feel like they should have just made this into an anime series, but they didn't. But you'll see from the artwork, it's, you know, got fast lines and spaceships flying and lots of blurring and stuff like that. The series is a futuristic or in another world. They never actually say what world this is on. That's one of the things I noticed. This could have been humans on Earth. It could be the future. It could be a different universe. Whatever it is, the plot of the story is there's this universe, galaxy, planet, or whatever it is, and they discover these giant dead gods. That's what they call them, gods. They're massive, and that's kind of one on the cover. That's a god, and the spaceships would be like this big. And they find these dead gods just floating on the edge of space. And what the society has done is they send out all these little autopsy ships, and they cut the parts all up, and they eat it, they sell it, they use the parts, they basically you know, being vultures, scavenging on a dead body. And there's a caste system there where the smaller ships get the crappier parts and the rich people and the big ships get like the eyeballs and the brain and the good stuff. And there's a captain of a ship. And what he wants, him and his crew want to do is he wants to find a living God. And that's the first half of the series about how he chases to try and find a living God and how the empire uh, tries to stop him. Uh, the second half of the series sort of is a big jump in time and a really cool twists and a very interesting ending. I loved this series. I felt it was way underrated. So go out and find this. Um, this I haven't found any feet on any of the covers yet, but I can guarantee you Rob Liefeld did not draw this. And that is for the best. So those are the 10 books that I wanted to share with you. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've either already read them or you want to run out and get the trades and read them online, whatever you want to do. But that's my recommendations for some great comic book reading material. Again, I've been Randy. This is Swarm Up Comics, and I thank you for joining me. Please comment, like, subscribe, all the things that I'm supposed to tell you to do so I get more viewers, so I can keep doing this and I can make millions of dollars so I don't have to sell my farts in jars anymore. I'm running out of jars. Thanks. Bye.